Hey everyone, um, so this is Karthik here. Um, I teach uh, machine learning courses in the professional master's program at University of Washington, Seattle. And uh, as a part of the course on recommender systems this summer of 2022, it's my pleasure to welcome Kunal Shah. So Kunal is an ML platform engineering manager at DoorDash, focusing on building feature engineering and model training platforms. Previously, he has worked on ML platforms and data engineering frameworks. Uh, at Airbnb and YouTube. He finished his computer science undergraduate at IIT Bombay and holds a master's in data science from UC Berkeley. Uh, fun fact about Kunal is uh, Kunal got inspired uh, to do ML platform engineering and data science when he took a similar course in a professional master's program some time back. So it's a full circle uh, to have Kunal back uh, to give a guest lecture on recommender systems and the ML ops behind recommender systems today. So let's all welcome Kunal. Uh, and we'll get started shortly. Thank you so much for the introduction, Karthik. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, definitely fun journey getting here. Uh, and really excited to share some part of that today um, with the folks here. Um, and with that, let me just share my screen. Uh, okay. And here we go. So uh, before I get started and before we actually go through this whole thing, um, maybe a good question to ask the audience is like, how familiar are folks with the term MLOps? Uh, going from one meaning, what the hell is MLOps? And 10 being like, get me started. I know how to do this already. Um, yeah, any uh, spectrum, uh, what, what's the feeling? On the audience. Yeah, maybe we can type in the chat. Uh, might be easier. Yeah, just throw a number in there. All right, seeing a couple of threes, and I will go with that. I'll go with the fact that uh, yeah, you know, ML ops is is somewhat familiar, but um, largely unfamiliar. So. Um, what I intend to do today is to kind of um, just free, like rephrase what this entire course has been for most of you all in terms of recommender systems and try to shine the light of ML platform on it. Like what does it look like from the other side? It's then this is not particularly a machine learning problem. And what does it mean to do this in production? Um, and yeah, uh, some context on myself as well as, as Karthik mentioned, like I've, I started off a long time ago in just core infrastructure. Uh, and over the couple, last couple of years, I've been meandering my way through different ML platforms. And so what, what I have here today is kind of like an amalgamation of some of those learnings. Um, yeah. So with that, um, let me kind of set the expectations for today and like, you know, kind of walk you through what you all can take away from this lesson. Uh, for like, this is a famous number that's been thrown out there. Uh, production ML is generally only 5% of actual machine learning. 95% of your time is actually going to go into infrastructure, setting up your models, piping it through multiple things, working through um, Kubernetes and all the other infrastructure problems. Um, and so today we want to kind of walk through what that 95% is all about. Um, and you know, once you have that in, in play, you'll know what to expect when you go in and apply ML to production systems. Um, so we'll walk through something uh, that resembles the anatomy of a production infrastructure stack. Uh, and we look at it, we'll specifically look at recommender, recommender systems as an example, but in general, a lot of these learnings apply to other ML problems as well. Uh, and we try to take a deeper dive into many of those components. Um, and then whenever I can, I'll bring it back to a survey of solutions that already exist in the wild. There's a lot of work that has gone into ML ops over the last few years. There's a lot of conferences and industry blogs that talk about different learnings. Um, and so we can go through some of those as well. Um, and yeah, oh, through the class, please feel free to interrupt me and ask me questions. I'm happy to answer those. Um, and I'll take a pause at after every section as well, just to revisit what we covered. So uh, what are we trying to cover today? Um, what I'm trying to do is to first try and rephrase uh, the recommendation system or the, the problem space from an MLOps perspective. What would it mean if you were an MLOps engineer, not a data science engineer, not 
uh, not a machine learning engineer, but rather somebody who's working with ML platform. What would this problem look like to you as that engineer? Uh, and then with that, we can start diving into the first, uh, like take a top-down view and then start diving into the inference problem first. That's what the end user sees. What is going to be the recommendation? From there, we'll step a little further back and try and enhance those recommendations. And that's where we'll dive into a bit of feature engineering. Um, and from there on, we'll kind of try to see what it would take to build models that can do this kind of uh, inference. Um, and then lastly, uh, I'll touch briefly upon what it means to iterate over these models. It's, it's good enough to push one out, but what does it mean to do this again and again and again, right? Um, so yeah, that's broadly um, the agenda for the day. Uh, so with that, I'll get it started. Uh, so yeah, let's say that uh, you know, for a problem statement for the day, we want to start trying to think about designing a black box recommendation service. Something goes in there and we don't know what yet. And we want to unpack some parts of that today in, in our course. But the goal is that it powers our app's homepage recommendations. And here, pick an app of your choice, Netflix, YouTube, DoorDash, um, uh, even Uber in some ways has, an, has a recommendation problem somewhere. So pick, pick any app. Our goal is to power that app's homepage recommendations. Um, and so through this, what you're trying to solve is not really the machine learning problem as such, but we are trying to build the infrastructure that powers this. Um, and so for that, like, we'll try to avoid the question of you know, which model or how to build that model, but we'll try to answer the question, given a model, let's say we have a ACE data scientist by our side, who's gonna give us a model that does amazing. It's got the best precision, the best accuracy. How do we actually bring that to production? And how can we leave room for evolution when we build our infrastructure? Because no matter how well ML performs, it is always ways to do better. So we wanna leave room for evolution in our infrastructure. And then lastly, this is not, uh, a project that we do for a starting app. Like we are trying to address the problem in the space of big data. We have hundreds and millions, hundreds of millions of customers or app page loads, and that's the traffic volume we want to scale our system to. That's that's our target. So with that, uh, you know, this is the black box that we want to solve. Uh, but even before we solve this problem, it's always good to set the frame of reference. When you are thinking of a machine learning problem, we are optimizing for, as I mentioned, precision, accuracy, AUC scores, all of all of the fun stuff. But when you want to solve this from an MLOps perspective, what what are our goals now? What am I trying to optimize for? What's the end result that I can hold as a KPI? What's my metric gains? Uh, and there's a few dimensions to these, and this is not a holistic list, but some of those dimensions are a recency or freshness of my recommendations. How quickly is my, my system responding to the changing ecosystem? Uh, what's the availability of my service? How, how many times can I send a request before and before a request fails for me and I don't get back the recommendation? Uh, what's my latency like? Am I looking at one second, 100 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds? What's, what's the turnaround rate for those requests that come back with recommendations? Uh, how scalable is my system? Will it break if suddenly tomorrow double the customers come to my homepage? For folks that are familiar with uh, you know, bumper sales, Grubhub often, uh, it's like sometimes has this thing where like if, if it does a discount coupon that is really viral, something may happen and if, if traffic comes in too frequently, the app may shut down. It's happened to all apps every once in a while. So scalability is a concern. Uh, but one more thing that you care about is costs. Uh, I can build a really complex system that does really well, but it doesn't really help if it costs me more than the returns of the machine learning problem itself. Right, so we want to keep our system cost effective, and then lastly, operational excellence. Uh, MLOps isn't uh, just a systemic problem, right? It's a people problem. It, it, it's as efficient as some of the engineers you have on your team, right? So, what does it take to maintain the system? And the more auto, the more automation you have, the more operational excellence you have. The faster it is to keep shipping features, to keep extending your system and maintain it. So, we want to make sure it's it's feasible to run this with a few engineers well. So uh, I, I, I went through a lot of those, but before I jump into the solution space, any questions around you know, the phrasing of the problem uh, that I can help answer? Oh, okay. So moving on. Uh, 
so as i said like let's try and take a top down view to the space right uh, when we think of this uh, this particular black box system that i you know refer you know reference here the first thing that we see is somebody is going to send us requests and we're going to have to return them back scores recommendation ranks for this problem space uh, how do we try to solve the inference problem first right and within production ml two broad paradigms come to life it's offline inference which is i am going to build my system offline i'm going to finish building out some recommendations and i'm going to store them somewhere and then when the app loads all it needs to do is access those right that's where the space of offline inference comes in uh and a second paradigm is online inference which is you know what my system is evolving quickly i can't really afford to have um systems like you know all the predictions pre produced can i do it live can you give me the return like as a request response model so we'll take a quick look at both of those um uh in this section of the uh you know the lecture um first let's talk about offline inference yeah in this i've kind of expanded the rect of the black box a little bit further and you know try to put in some components but largely offline serving as an architecture starts off with a table of input data and we'll address how we build this later so let's say somehow you manage to build your data set and this is your evaluation data set that you want to do on a periodic basis uh you're going to pass this off to your recommendation model and an ace data scientist built this for us um and eventually we're going to push the results the scores out to a data warehouse and once the warehouse has these results it's actually a simpler process to get some requests and push the scores out um so i've said a bunch of keywords here right like i said a couple of things about how the system looks so let's take a deeper dive what does this architecture actually do and what components do we need the first part is orchestration right uh there is this in the, this diagram references an input data which on a periodic basis is going to connect to a recommendation model and push the results out to a data warehouse this thing needs to be orchestrated there needs to be a runner that actually does this on a periodic basis consistently scalably and have a containerized runtime uh what do i mean by containerized runtimes um your models are you know your data scientists trained a model in a specific environment they had some libraries they needed they had some additional things they built um they built up let's say let's stay in python world for now let's say they built a pythonic model by their whether it be pytorch or light gpm doesn't really matter they built a model within a specific environment you need to recreate this environment when you actually run the inference that running of the inference is going to require a containerized runtime that can evolve right you could have data scientists that want to change their models over time you need to be able to bring their environment right into our ecosystem so the orchestration system has to take care of that it needs to be able to adapt to however the model was built and then run this on a daily basis or hourly basis depends on your cadence consistently and scalably and by scalably i mean anywhere between 1 million to 1 billion data types right um and that's that's the orchestration piece uh but once that's done you also need a highly scalable uh data warehouse what it what that what your data warehouse needs to do is first house your training data from which you can have high throughput bulk reads you are going to read lots of rows in a distributed manner into your orchestration system but you are also going to write a large number of rows out and that also needs to be high throughput so you need a warehouse that is able to read and write large amounts of data at really high throughputs um and then lastly you're going to need distributed compute now um to sprinkle some context onto this one um you like when you actually build your training data set you could have a lot of transformations that happen at, like, like in your data those transformations could be simple transformations like you just tokenizing a string or they could be something more complex in terms of transformation which is you could be pulling embeddings creating embeddings and all of those could be parts of your model we need an etl service etl stands for extract transform load a generic term for a system that can take in data transform it and push it out you need an etl engine that can perform your transformations in a vectorized manner it can apply those transforms to a large amounts of data in parallel a very easy example of this is what spark does uh, or what generally what generally most map reduce frameworks do but you need to be able to apply those complex transforms onto your data set and push those out into your data warehouse 
even if these three components exist there is the magic sauce that you need and so i call this magic sauce expertise but your tools are only going to work as well as how you use them you could take spark and that is really efficient at performing transformations but if you really use them for sequential transforms if you actually convert every spark transform into local memory runs you bring the data back to your driver nodes and you do some kind of bad practices you're not really going to gain any efficiency so even if you have all of these three tools you kind of need to build an expertise of how to use them so that you can connect the dots it's basically what i call plumbing skills once you have efficient solutions for the three components that you need you're going to have to plumb them together to finally serve your production use cases um so yeah these are the high level components that you kind of need to build out for an optimal inference um so if you did build these out what would your production system look like like at this point now i have chosen offline inference how have i done with my problem space right in practice batch inference does really well if recency or freshness is not one of your biggest concerns uh what i mean by that is if your ecosystem isn't evolving on a minutely basis or an hourly basis if you have something that stays consistent for a day uh this system does fine a really good example of this is people you may know right people that you may know on linkedin facebook and so on these don't evolve every minute right if if i get a suggestion one day late i'm not going to bother about it it's fine i still know this person i may choose the recommendation um so recency is not a big problem for this uh however it is good to have this be really available and uh, low latency right when i load my home page if i'm looking at the people you may know column i'm looking for answers right away so that's where availability and latency are a big win for the system the answers are ready the data has been pushed in like the data warehouse knows you know which people you know so um availability and latency are really good for batch inference systems um as are scalability and costs i call this as a plus in this because if you choose the right warehouse scalability comes for free like pretty much your only cost in this particular case is your distributed compute which is not particularly the biggest concern in the world of big data right now and these systems scale well they are designed to be parallel your data warehouses will be designed to be parallel you will not likely lose much on costs so this system does really well on that however operational excellence i put that as as an unknown it depends on how you use your ecosystems and how much data you are processing so like this one is a wild card you could do really well or really poorly on operational excellence depending on various skill set are if if you are as a company that is ml heavy you may find yourselves um lacking a little bit on the operational excellence because you have to really relearn how spark has evolved or what are the best practices out there you may have to go out of your way to understand those practices a bit of a problem right there so given that in the while is there something that is ready to use right like what if you want to solve only the ml problem but i want to batch inference for free uh this i i usually break down this answer into build versus buy statements and so you'll see this a lot throughout this lecture there's a lot of solutions you can buy there is google uh, sorry aws sagemaker there is google ai platform many of these companies and their solutions have designed good batch inference solutions um and many of these components that i have right here come for free you will you'll be able to take bring in your input data plug in a model that you have have that transform run for you you don't have to worry about the distributed compute the orchestration they'll give that to you for free you'll have to turn up your knobs but yeah buy solutions exist on the flip side buy solutions are really expensive normally they charge on a per prediction basis um and depending on your expertise you may find your costs escalating over time uh if on the flip side if you are trying to build this you need to bring in each of these components and honestly when i say build i'm in this particular lecture it's out of scope to build the components themselves so let's say i am actually not building the orchestration system i'm actually bringing them in that's that's the frame of reference we'll operate on of course you can always go one level deeper and build those as well but let's stay at this plane for, for the time being uh orchestration has a large number of oss solutions out there but even if you didn't like oss you could bring in an enterprise solution for orchestration airflow and axer have both uh oss components as well as enterprise solutions on top of those but you could choose one of those and you can have orchestration as a service you could similarly bring in data warehouses from different kinds of enterprise and oss solutions hive delta lake iceberg are now open source but you could also just lean back on aws redshift snowflake like companies for um uh, hosted warehouses 
And just like that, you can, depending on your warehouse choices, you can bring in the right compute for your, um, for your efforts. HiveQL and Presto are some examples of SQL-based computational resources. So you could define how you want to transform your data from one step to another through SQL before you plug it into your models. Or you could go a bit more programmatic and go for Ray, Spark, and other paradigms that help you write more program-heavy transformations. So um, that's kind of like one way to think about this space. Uh, yeah, with that, I'll take a brief pause before jumping into online inference. Uh, yeah. Any questions on offline inference? Yeah, it, it looks like, uh, thanks Kunal for this. Uh, for the offline inference, it looks like uh, one of the other motivations for uh, online inference is uh, if you have a query you've never seen before, it's not possible to uh, compute scores for it. Uh, okay. You know, you have to do it in real time. And so that that's another motivation for the next phase, right? Um, just yeah, to put that, that is off. exactly right. Uh, although there, yeah, there are ways in which people get around that. Um, so just to answer that, that specific query that you mentioned, uh, for example, unknown queries, one way uh, like embeddings rank, uh, uh, query rankings work is you, you transform them into embeddings, right? And then what you really have is, is not really a recommendation model as much as the, the nearest embedding search problem space. And so as long as you have a good amount of embeddings that are nearest to your query, there's gonna be something that you can serve out. And this one goes into the middle ground between online and offline, which is, I have pre-populated certain amount of results, but I'm gonna do one step further to find the nearest result for my query. But again, it does go into, a, like goes into the online part. So you can't solve everything offline. There has to be an online component for many of our systems, especially for traversing the unknowns. Uh, maybe representative embedding so that you have efficient uh, inference. Exactly. With this. Um, another question I have is the operational excellence part. Mm -hmm. What are some metrics uh, that we usually say the model is not, or the system is not performing well? Uh, Amazing question. Uh, operational excellence is a very, very uh, heavily measured term. Um, if you think of production systems, many ways to think about it is a number of engineering hours spent in just maintaining the system. I mean, the number of engineering hours spent in upgrading these systems. Uh, one very easy example is, let's say that your system was no longer scalable because um, your, uh, your, your distributed and, uh, compute clusters were not big enough. Let's say you didn't have enough nodes on your machine and eventually your company outgrew your data. So you needed to upscale your warehouse, you need to upscale your compute. Right? These are simple questions that somebody needs to step in. These are not automatic. Even if you have a hosted solution, somebody needs to do it. Like that's one form of uh, maintenance. Another thing is customers did not, uh, the data scientists did not use this well, right? They wrote pipelines that were inefficient and your costs skyrocketed. Operational excellence now steps in to try and optimize these pipelines, try to find better ways to get better machines, get better RAM, switch from CPU to GPU. All of these are operational excellence concerns. So there's ways to measure support hours, uh, maintenance hours, uh, enhancement, and so on. So yeah, um, that all of that leaks into operational excellence. Yeah, thanks Karthik, great questions. Uh, and many of these flavors will keep recurring, so you might find uh, answers later as well. So uh, with that, I'll jump into um, online inference. Um, with this uh, setting, what we are looking at now is we still have uh, a model that our data scientists provided to us, but we now want to switch to a request response model. We don't particularly know what we are going to see upfront. So based on that, our recommendation service now evolves into a hosted service that has a larger number of model pods we can send queries to. And with this, what it, what it means is you send in your inputs and you get back the scores. Similar to how your in, table does it in offline, but now you don't have a table anymore. These will come live. Excuse me. And if you see here, I have an additional component called feature store, which I would love to describe more. But uh, in a, in, like in brief, a feature store is simply a store with additional features for your data. Not everything can be sent in the user request. So what additional data can I pull from my own servers, from my own systems to enrich the feature vector going into my models before I get the outputs back? 
Um, so the recommendation system now devolves into a horizontally scalable set of pods, each of them that host my model that can send, that can serve the request and send back the scores. So let me dive into this a little bit more. What do I now need for this infrastructure? And while this looks deceptively simple, a lot goes in behind the scenes to make this possible. The first is containerized model serving. We previously looked at containerized runtimes. We still need those, but now we need to split those into multiple copies of parts. We need a lot, lot more machines that host the same containerized runtime that host my model that once I send in a request can actually send me back a response. And this needs to be reliable and available. So now your availability problem is no longer just for the warehouse. It now scales up to each of these parts. They all need to be available. They need to address their availability concerns and they need to be scaling up to the traffic you'll get. But what you need after that is also an extensible RPC protocol. So maybe I'll pause here to ask a question to the audience. Um, we discussed this, like, you know, the app server is gonna send me a request and I'm gonna get back a response. Um, do you have a feeling of how the requests look different for when you're sending a request to an offline serving um, ecosystem versus an online serving ecosystem? What change in the request payload do you envision? Any takers for this uh, question? There are no wrong answers. Just take a take a shot. All right. Let me try and motivate that answer and see if that helps. Um, in when you have an offline prediction, so let's say I'm loading my homepage. Uh, what's going to be present in the ecosystem is is my user ID, right? I am the one that's opening my homepage. So me as a user has sent has a, some amount of session information that you can send back that will help you get a response. Now in an offline prediction world, there has to be a key that you store your predictions against, right? So for example, people you may know, it's going to be the people I know. So there's going to be some indexed entries that is, that is ranked for my user ID. That's pretty much all the information I should need. And that's going to be enough to serve my recommendations out. However, in the online world, you're, you're looking for the system to be more agile. You want to be online because you want to send more context so that there is more relevant recommendations to serve. So now your requests get heavier. You, you want to send in a richer payload. You want to send more information for the system to know what recommendations are relevant to you. So you're no longer sending in just a user ID. For So hypothetically, you, if you were doing something like um, restaurant recommendations, let's say Yelp, your geolocation matters now. You could have recommendations that are different for your user persona if you were sitting in California versus if you're sitting in New York. Now that becomes relevant information. Uh, depending on the time of day, you could get different responses. That becomes relevant information. So these systems, online recommendation systems, now need to have a more flexible request response protocol. These need to be uh, flexible and backwards compatible because your request response structure could change over time. So this also becomes something that becomes relevant to your model. So what your system, your architecture will need is one way for users to define your RPC protocols over time. And then lastly, what you need is a scalable feature store. Uh, and for this, like not all context information can be sent in a request. So whatever cannot be becomes a part of your feature store. And I'll expand on more, more shortly about why you would need this information. Why can't my context suffice to serve my recommendations out? But Let's assume for now that we need this, then this feature store needs to be low latency and support randomized reads because you don't know what, requ what request you're gonna get. But depending on the request, your turnaround still needs to be quick. You need to serve a request out in let's say 100 milliseconds. Let's say that's my goal, that I wanna send the request back out with the response in 100 milliseconds. And clearly any lookups that I would do for features need to be equally fast. And so these needs to be low latency for randomized reads. Um, also, uh, just like we did it last time, what's our magic sauce? Uh, this time around, our magic sauce is microservice engineering. Previously, we wanted data engineers that understood how to connect end-to-end, -end, how to plumb the request through an offline framework. Now we kind of need 
more expertise in best practices for plumbing and end to end request architecture what's the right number of pods i can host how can i keep them uh, available what's what's going to be scalable for them all of these needs to be robust and fault tolerant for your recommendation system to not collapse depending on how traffic changes that's where microservice engineering skills come uh, skill set uh, comes in handy right um so oh um i see a question uh, hey mundra uh, what can i answer thanks kunal kunal really enjoyed the talk so far and looking forward for further content uh, a quick question on the rpc you mentioned that the request will get heavier so what aspect about rpc protocol and i believe they are they probably optimize on the byte size but I, i want to confirm that what are the other things which rpc enables in terms of or is a better protocol compared to others for for sending request right so yeah i think rpc isn't a placeholder for a solution space i think rpc is like any protocol is fine I, and this is not to say that one framework is better than the other okay uh, the recommendation is more in terms of uh, i should not use recommendation that's overloaded but the guideline here is to actually have a framework for your request it's not the wild west like send me a generic json and i'll give you back your request right so the rpc protocol will help you define the structure for what request is eligible for a recommendation system right if you have opinions on what additional data you want your app server to send you for your recommendation server the protocol will help you define that so as i discussed later in the next slide mm -hmm. one way to do this is grpc google's rpc protocol yeah, which yeah. lets you define a protobuf based mm -hmm. uh, architecture but you could have a generic restful service Okay. that define the structure to your json and that's also an equally acceptable form of doing the protocol okay okay so it's more around what you're trying to stress here is that the contracts are well defined correct okay so you need a good sla like a service level agreement which is like i will send you this information and this information needs to be nested in this form i want a dictionary and so on and that right. is expected okay yeah, yeah. thank you so uh, so wouldn't that be required even in a uh, data warehouse one i mean i un i understand that you had like sql techno like technologies there along with uh, spark and ray uh, but in yeah. any case yeah i can answer that so yeah. the reason why this is simple and it's not a prerequisite in this particular case is because the only agreement you really have is what is my prediction or what is my inference keyed on what is that one look up value mm. that suff that suffices for me to look uh, look up my prediction scores and mm. because it's like the single value there isn't really a protocol you need to define you just need to agree on what that value is right. again that agreement is definitely required but mm. we are putting the responsibility on the app server at this point to look this up scalably now uh, to answer a little bit more detail you're right in that sense that if you actually put this warehouse behind another service Let's right. say actually put up a scalable load balancer of sorts yeah. Yeah. that takes the user's request and actually looks up the score for them in the data warehouse. Mm -hmm. Then I need a protocol again. So you could have this offline online uh, hybrid, which kind of is what Karthik alluded to, where you could put an extra layer of indirection on right. in front of the service, and then you need a protocol to define that again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great question, though. Thanks, Mudra. Uh, yeah. So jumping back to the looking at this system in production how does online uh, inference perform in practice uh we have a few changes here so based on the offline world you do really well on recency and freshness and online service can actually be as fresh as it needed to be and when i say as fresh there exist online services for recommendation that can respond within seconds of a user doing something to three balancing the recommendations uh one way to think about this is sometimes like friend recommendations could refresh the moment you befriend a new person people you may know if if they are responsive can refresh the moment you befriend someone some of these are post processing like if i befriend someone they should disappear from my recommendations is an application layer logic but there can also be a recommendations layer logic that respond the moment you like something and this also responds to search histories i could search for burgers right now and i could have the page refresh to recommendations that put burger chains higher in the recommendations list because i've searched for burger clearly i'm looking for burgers right now recommending thai food to me is not going to help 
convert the recommendations. So recency is really as fresh as it needed to be. Um, availability as well is not easy, but is a strong suit because there, there is like, you know, you did fault tolerance, uh, fault tolerance systems. So systems are always available and you can actually put them as, as many as, as many nines as you want for availability, depending on how robust you keep your pods scalability. However, latency takes a hit. Inference is not easy for folks that have tried playing around with uh, deep learning models. As complex your model gets, the more inference heavy the system begins and you're doing inference live. Even if you send batches of inference requests, if you're actually putting it then through layers of deep learning, you're not going to get like the few milliseconds of latency a data warehouse can give compared to like actually running this inference live. So latency will take a hit, but you're taking that as a cost for recency. Um, scalability and costs, I'll put this one a year as an equal to because operational excellence or um, the number of pods you need to maintain to keep a system scalable is all very manual. And it will depend on how complex a system is that you're serving live how complex your feature stores are, how much they need to scale depending on your freshness. These things are a little harder and you are solving this problem yourself. It's not free with a warehouse as, as we had it in the offline case. And operational excellence in this case is a definite hit because it takes a lot of skill to maintain the system's life. Even if you bring in hosted solutions, you are in the loop for maintaining them. If something goes down, somebody's not going to be like the warehouse is down, being the warehouse folks now. It's going to be your services that are down because they're not like they're sending 500 back to the end user. So you need to fix those services. You need to have a robust on call. You need to have a support process in place to make the system keep working. So operational excellence will take a hit for online services. So um, with that, do we have something that is ready for us to use? If we, if we don't want to build the whole thing for ourselves, can we get the solutions ready? There's a lot of open source and uh, enterprise solutions that are ready for you to use as is. And that's what I put in the buy column. Selden is a solution. Selden Core is built for serving models like you bring in, bring them your model. They'll put that for online inference behind well-hosted machines. They'll scale those out for you. Your only problem is bring them to the bringing them a model with their service constraints. They have a specific service structure defined. That is what you'll have to follow. Your production services will send those requests in that protocol. Sultan will send your result back. Same for Triton. SageMaker is not open source. SageMaker is hosted AWS. You'll pay on a per request basis. Contrastingly, if you have more specific needs that these systems don't fit in with, I, I want a different request structure, or my internal VPC is built differently. VPC is your virtual private cloud. Let's say your cloud infrastructure is not compatible with these systems. Then you try to now start building your own ecosystem. Um, and containerizing your model serving is gonna be the easier of the problems. Kubernetes and Docker have made this extremely scalable across the entire spectrum of infrastructure. Um, and the same for RPC protocols, uh, like Mudra brought this up, a gRPC is one of those, but you have many other protocols. Like you can really go with any RESTful API, that's up to you. Pick one, you can't really go wrong with it. Scalable feature stores is the fun part, and I'll discuss this later, but that will be the chunk of your responsibilities when you're building a service online. And in my next, next section, I'll kind of go through this, but that's where your challenges will be if you build the system um, um, online. With this, I'll take a pause, just take a breath, uh, let folks digest this and yeah, any questions that I can answer on just serving. I think uh, Pratibha has a question in the chat. Oh, let me jump in the chat. Data barfing during online inference. Could you expand on data barfing, Pratibha? I guess what I meant to say is uh, like during uh, like you can use all these Docker and containerization, but then uh, I think I, uh, uh, like during your model when when you are doing your inference, either it it breaks or like it just like stops running. Is there like a, a reason for that occurring? Or do you think like containerization is not like done well, something of that sort? So when, so maybe let me double click on that. When you say model is breaking, does it mean that what was working fine? Like I, I was sending in requests, getting back responses, suddenly stops working and I no longer get the response back or is it that yeah. the response is garbled and does not make sense? Yeah, like it doesn't get any response back. Uh, 
yeah, that could be a broad spectrum of responsibilities. I usually put those all under OPEX, operational excellence. But okay. really what's gone wrong somewhere is either your pods went down and enough number of pods went down where your request is getting routed to that one single pod that will, will not send you back a response. And for that, it could have just been the GRP, the, the server that was hosting that model died, right? Uh, to answer this question a little better, going up here, each of these is a pod. But what mm -hmm. I mean by a pod is there's a container in there that has a small server running that accepts a, accepts a request, understands the paradigm of your request, sends it back to the model, gets the prediction back out, and then wraps that back up in the response and pushes this back out to your app server, right? Okay. Anywhere within this round trip, anything could break. You could have a faulty load balancer, you could have a faulty message passing queue that's failing to call your model. Your, your model could have just died because mm -hmm. the you know the host for the model or just your your machine out of memory. You could have really a leakage in your model where your model was just slowly over time building state, it leaked memory and it died, and no nothing put it back up. That's also a part of fault tolerance, which is to make sure a system has metrics in place to keep keep the system alive. So many ways that the model could have died. Not sure if I answered the exact reason why you were expecting the model to die, but yeah, those are some ways um, okay, you could okay. just stop getting responses. Right, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, like I think this is a great question. There is an example of why operational excellence is a big negative on this one. There is a lot of things that can go wrong because a system that looks deceptively simple is just filled with plumbing, right? Every single, every single step in this jump can fail. Not like the previous one where the data warehouse goes down. So I can ping someone and say, hey, fix the warehouse and my, so my, my predictions come back online. No, not as simple as that. A lot of things need, that need to be monitored for healthiness. Um, sorry. A couple Any? of points, uh, if I can share Kunal. Yeah. Um, so one is, you know, in the in the space of uh, modeling, we have seen this happen in the past that you have a very amazing transformer model and then the latency is 300 milliseconds and you're like, sorry, not happening. Has to be less than 50 milliseconds for our uh, requirement. And then you scale it down to some kind of an LSTM or something. The other thing is you can take a model and just do hacks on it so that you reduce the number of layers or you kind of encode certain things beforehand. And then at serving time, you pass in other information to encode and then finally compute the scores. Have you seen this uh, kind of uh, thing happen in, in your experience as well? Yes, plenty of times, actually. Um, and uh, like I love, I love a fun anecdote on this in the feature store section as well. But um, a very good example of where uh, latency breaks down is when, you, when your recommendation system is embedding heavy. If you have the more the number of entities in your system that need embedding, your model tends to get larger, right? And each of these pass through, each of them get transformed into their embedding before going to the final layers that do the prediction for you, right? One way to fix the system, uh, hypothetically, is you, you change your embeddings to an offline system. So you instead of pushing your embeddings live, you take that part of your model out, pluck it out, push it into an offline ecosystem where your embedding now becomes a feature. And what I mean by feature is you will not actually be inferencing that embedding live. And this is fine to do. Maybe those entities don't mutate that much, right? If I have a burger, a burger is a burger, right? It's embedding is not going to change over time. I could just learn the embedding for this, push it into a system and leave it there. And so when the time, when it comes time to serve, like recommend an item to a user, I'm just going to load the embeddings for all items in my ecosystem and put those as a feature. Now your model has to do lesser work and you keep plucking those systems out and putting them as offline features till just the the relevant system, the things that need to be agile, that need to respond quickly, become parts of your model input. The remaining start becoming offline systems. And again, there's only so much you can push the bounds of this one. At some point, you will still need to be live, in which case you start becoming more innovative with uh, you know parallel models and stuff like that. It, it, like it gets really hairy, the, the cutting towards the cutting edge side of MLOps. I'll leave those out uh, for another day. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Sure. I think it's always a tension between what uh, a modeling person wants to do and what MLOps can actually yeah. support. <laughs> yeah. uh, another question, quick question, uh, is uh, when we have this uh, decision between buy and build for mm -hmm. uh, online serving service that we want to have, then is 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 it is does it happen that you can do buy but you choose to do build because of cost? 
Yes. Um, and again, it's 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 a very common trend for you know ML you know, ML platforms within companies that start off where you begin with a buy to get your product on the road, right? Like you begin with this idea that like I don't know if this is going to work. Let me just try and step on this uh, and try to bring in solutions from the outside that help me start my problem space off. But once you kick it off, you realize that you know some things some things are not going to be sustainable. Like either the pricing model is too high or my scale is too big for this to work. And I reach a scale where now it's better for me to invest engineering time into this and actually make this system more sustainable in the long term. And that that will always happen. Like even with most buy buy decisions, you tend to start migrating some pieces to build slowly over time. Like you'll instead of taking a full view of your solution, you'll go one step deeper, you'll pluck a few components out and you'll invest in those instead. Open source if you can, enterprise if you can't, and then maybe you need to dive deeper and actually pu pu push those out and build for that as well, right? Like, you know, in this case, containerized model serving, I could use Kubernetes and Docker uh, on top of a cloud infra, but at some point, maybe I decided that, my company decided that cloud infra was too expensive to stay on on-prem. Maybe I can bring those machines in and host my own machines. You start trying to dive into that. So there's a lot of nuances that go into build versus buy for sure. All right, great question too. I will flow on and go into the interesting space of enhancing your models. So um, as Karthik mentioned, like there's only so much you can do with what your model has available within its own ecosystem, right? Within the request, whatever information that you can send through uh, and pass through your models, there's a limitation. In the end, what you really find yourself is in need for better data, right? My model needs more information to do better, right? So how do I provide this to my models? So this section kind of focuses on enhancing those. So before I go there, it's good to draw the line between two types of features, broad categories. The first is contextual features, information that is present at the time of your recommendation. Like it's part of a session. So your user ID, your session ID, your actual search query, all of these are live. Like these things you can pass in your request. And even if they are not part of a request, they are one-on-one -on -one lookups. What's my user's uh, geolocation, right? It's a one-to-one -one location a lookup, probably stored somewhere, easy to fetch. Still part of the context, production systems can do it fine. You don't really need your MLOps system to answer those questions. But then we kind of get into the weeds here environmental or engineered features. What does my ecosystem look like when this event happened? Some ways to think about this is item reviews. Like let's say you're trying to get item recommendations. How is this item being reviewed by other folks that have similar interests to mine, right? Or um, how what orders have I placed in the last week that can help the system send better recommendations my way so that they can leverage that information? These are environmental information. They are not available when you load your homepage. It's impossible to have all of that information on the homepage at that time. So you want to pre-compute some information and serve those during inference. This space of features is called engineered features. So what does feature engineering mean? Like, what does it look like? These environmental features will actually represent a measurable concept for your problem. If you are in the space of recommendations, one, uh, if you're in the space of, uh, let's say Amazon, like you want to recommend things when you load your homepage for what you want to order. Now, in this case, there's a lot of different ways to think about the measurable concept. One, one thing is my last one week's trend or preference. Like how does Amazon know that you may have recently, you, you may recently have bought a new house or how does Amazon know that you have recently looking to invest in, uh, weight training equipment, right? Like how does Amazon know these things, right? It represents a measurable concept and this is called user preference. And this is one possible environmental feature. Uh, one other thing is what other users are similar to you in terms of interest preferences and what have they bought recently? This can bring in the wealth of information of what items are new on the system that I can recommend to like-minded users. This also is an environmental feature. All of these features, even though they sound very similar to your problem, they, can, they actually tend to be model independent. Your, your taste preference isn't linked to your models. What you like as a consumer is your property, right? What you like as um, when the homepage loads or what other people are doing when the homepage loads is not a recommendation 
attribute. It's something that is innate to you as a user. 70% of most of production ML is finding these nuggets. Like you want to find the right features that can make your system perform better. And these features tend to come in two flavors again, which is batch and real-time features. One possibility is I can capture your trend over time. I can see what you did over the last 30 days and use that to understand you better as a user. And that becomes a feature. That's one flavor of environmental features. On the flip side, think systems that need to be very agile, they need to respond to what you did right away. They could rely on real-time features. They could aggregate your patterns or behaviors over the last 30 minutes. I, in the last 30 minutes, I have looked a lot at weight training equipment. I want to re recommend more weight training equipment to you. This system needs to respond to those environmental trends quicker. And this may not actually be a part of your own session, right? Um, one other uh, really good example of being uh, like responding to real-time features is I'm placing an order at a restaurant, right? Any, any delivery app, take DoorDash for example. My constraint is I want to order from restaurants that are going to deliver in 30 minutes or less. I, I, I'm, I'm a very picky customer. I do not like my food being cold or late, right? How can I make ETA strongly accurate? My restaurant could have a flurry of orders in the last 30 minutes, which is going to make sure my particular order is 45 minutes or later. That's a horrible customer experience for me. The system knows that, right? How can I help my system train models to that can that know that? The way to do that is to actually have a feature that tends to know how the restaurant is doing in the last 30 minutes. If the restaurant has a lot of order in the last 30 minutes, the system knows that most likely based on the current traffic of orders, the system is gonna be slower. One example of a real-time feature would really help me make my recommendations more accurate and I'll push those lower and I'll recommend your restaurants that are 30 minutes or faster, higher up in your queue. So different ways in which real-time or batch features can inform. Like my preference of wanting orders 30 minutes or lesser is a batch feature. I could learn this based on my trends. But which restaurants are quick enough to respond to that is a real-time feature. And both of those would be relevant to rank restaurants accordingly. So uh, looks like I'm actually running low on charge. Give me one second to uh, attach. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, looks like Ishan has a question. Um, hi, Gunal. Thanks for carrying out this session. Really enjoying the uh, uh, knowledge that you're giving. Um, so I had a question about uh, real-time features that you just talked about. So when we are talking about real-time features, we are often looking at uh, data that is usually clickstream data or the time visited uh, uh, on a particular product. And uh, so what if we are explicitly uh, asking for feedback from the user? So when we are saying that, do you like this product or not? do not like this product, then how do we integrate that into our model? Do we change the preference set or do we change our data in the warehouse for future recommendations? Because from what I know, I think this, uh, this preference has to be included in all of our future recommendations, right? While keeping that uh, in all of our results. Great question. Uh, so I, I'll break this question down into two parts. The first is, for your models to respond to a real-time feature, you actually have to train a model to respond to those. So what you really need to do is actually collect enough data based on real-time events and like have a training data that is you know, concurrent in time, like point in time correct in terms of looking these feature values up to know how accurately to respond to this. Now, in this particular case, the example that you've picked is like a, a, you know, a user preference that goes in live and you want to adjust based on that. Sometimes the good way to do that is to actually put this in application layer logic. Your rankings may come down to, you know, a black box set of rankings, but based on what I, what actions I've taken, I may choose to block out certain rankings. This kind of goes into the people you may know problem. If I friended someone right now, I don't need to change the recommendations or the score of that person. What I need to do is have some kind of application layer wrappers that tell the system that this person is already done. Like I've already finished this person. I no longer need to know that I may know this person. So then you kind of refresh the rankings and sort of post-process them after the model part is done. So not all real-time interactions can be modeled into your model. So you have to pick and choose what seems to be a good input, like binary things like, uh, I don't want to see this in the future seems like, you know, user-specific preference that says block this out for me. 
on the flip side, something else could be like, um, you know, this is an interaction pattern that I can model. Let's put that into the model itself. Does that help? Yeah, that definitely help. Thank you. Uh, Kunal, one more question. Um, so, for the event streams, um, it looks like maybe uh, dense versus sparse or continuous versus jumpy streams have mm -hmm. uh, impact on our decision making on whether we want a service to compute these and store in a database and then look it up, or it's not possible because there's going to be delays and that's going to impact the jumpy streams, mm -hmm. uh, the data jumpy streams. Like suddenly there is a shoot up in the waiting time, and that was that cannot be captured with uh you know pre-compute and store and then retrieve right um uh, uh the answer is it depends uh so if you want your models to react to the jumpy streams because that is an accurate representation or accurate indicator for how to change the prediction values you can actually and so real-time computation systems and i'll cover that shortly are designed to be reactive enough for that um, and so you want your systems to be granular enough for that. If you cannot handle those, you can provide some kind of filtering that says, like if your stream is really jumpy, choose a sampling and make let that be an approximate measure. But then your corresponding training should do the similar process. You can't actually follow different paradigms in training versus online. Your online behavior so should mimic how you would respond during your training and evaluation runs. And that way your model will respond fairly accurately. Uh, but yeah, again, the answer will be it depends. Um, uh, but if you care about it enough, you can actually uh, design around jumpy streams. So, you know, let me cover that shortly in the next set of slides as well, and maybe that'll help too. So, um, that brings us to uh, a, 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 you know, a solution to the space. Like we discussed why we care about these features, how do we solve it? Feature store has become a broad term within our uh, MLOps industry right now, which is an umbrella solution that tries to generate, maintain, and serve engineered features. And each of these three, three things are important. And of these, generation is the only one that's optional, and I'll describe why. Some feature stores tend to skip the generation part and only provide the maintenance and serving of engineered features. Uh, but broadly, this breaks down into three components. You need an infrastructure that helps you create these features. You need offline storage that helps you retrieve these features for training data and offline inference. And if you have real-time features, you kind of want your offline storage to be able to fetch point in time correct features. And then thirdly, you need an online storage that can help serve these features at low latency for online inference. And I draw the line between offline and online for a very specific reason, which is the latency plus costs measure. Offline storage is bulk reads, for training or for offline inference, like you want to read a large number of rows together. And so your, 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 your problem is not latency. Your problem is how quickly and how cheaply can I read a large amount of data. For online, your problem space is different. You want to read a small number of values very quickly at very high latency, uh, sorry, at very high speed or low latency. And so those are a more costly storage. And so you want to be judicious about what goes into the online storage. So that's why those two flavors are different for a feature store. Um, so jumping with that context into the architecture, a feature store broadly looks like this. Uh, I've discussed a data warehouse before, but now you bring in event streams, which is the other form of input to our systems, batch inputs, historical data, and event streams is uh, streaming input, real-time data, Kafka streams and so on. You could have your, uh, a computational layer either for batch or for real time that aggregates your events, your data and different time cadences. You could have hourly cadence, minutely cadence, secondly cadence and so on, and pushes it to both offline storage for your training and pushes it to online storage for serving. So taking a deeper dive into these pieces, there's two parts, the compute plane and the storage plane. If you have a compute plane and if, if your feature store is looking to build this, you can focus on one or both of these solutions. You can have an ETL framework that helps you com compute historical features. And for many systems, this is enough. So if you don't want to go too deep, too complex, you could stop here. You could have an ETL solution, build batch features and be okay with serving those live. But if you want something more agile, you're looking for real-time processing. And in this case, you need a framework that operates on event data to create signals. Why is this compute plane optional? 
because a company actually has these problems not just for ml ops right you have the problem of doing real time processing you have the problem of doing batch computations on data normally like a big data platform needs to solve these problems so you may get these for free so you may not need to have stronger opinions on how features can be produced from this framework but you could choose to adapt and use whatever solutions you get there and try to use it to build your features out and you push it into the storage plane so that brings us to the storage plane this is core and it's core for many reasons but feature specific solutions for offline and online storage are usually required for an online serving solution this is because you have opinions on what offline online sku looks like when you put data into training it should be the same behavior that happens when you look the same request in production the inference that you do should have the same response and should have the same structure as your offline world and so you actually have a better structure that you need to put on top of your warehouse put on top of your online store that responds to specifically the ml ops problem and that doesn't necessarily mean you can't use solutions that exist for storage in the rest of your company's ecosystem but you want to add a little bit more awareness of how features fit into this ecosystem so your warehouses need to be again high throughput for bulk reads and writes but your online storage should be something that is like a kv store or an columnar store that can respond well at low latency for really um high scale but also have a high throughput on writes because this system is getting refreshed quickly and so based on that refresh rate you want to be able to write very quickly to the system one really good example for this that we've used a lot in the past many companies do it is redis redis is an in memory store designed to serve both reads and writes at really high scale so um with that before i take a brief pause what does um the, what does a feature store look like in production feature store performance is measured a bit differently because it injects itself into your online serving latency so whatever latency your feature store has gets added into how quickly your online service can respond so there is more pieces that you need to start thinking about with your feature store that is a different perspective from what we saw so far you need your feature store to be flexible you need different types of features to go into it numerical features embedding features arrays scalars um categorical variables many things can get served through feature stores so it needs to be flexible for different paradigms you need good throughput for your offline stores you also need low latencies for your online stores for both of the storage layers you need them to be scalable i'm going to have hundreds and millions hundreds of millions of requests going in these need to be served correctly and stay at that availability and latency all the time and lastly you need operational excellence remember this is an extra hop every time we add a hop that goes to a different layer and comes back there's going to be operational excellence required you need to be fault tolerant you need to know what to do when systems fail so again operational excellence is a big concern um so what does it look like in the wild there is plenty of feature stores out there that have addressed all of these problems and are designed to be scalable uh feast is one tecton is a company that uh, provides feature stores as an enterprise solution at scale hopsworks is another company that does something similar but also many companies have published large amounts of blogs that builds scalable feature stores uh airbnb doordash netflix uber all of these companies have in house solutions that they have published uh you know in the, in this ecosystem um and those are good solutions to look at and i've put this link here because if, if for folks who are curious feature store is kind of like a really hot topic more recently in mlops and there's a lot of different feature stores uh both in house and in the op uh, open source community that people have played around with um it just is a good uh exercise to look at what each store is optimizing and what were they designed for and again they all kind of link back to the flexibility piece because they need to fit into your company's infrastructure and your production stack with that i'll take a quick pause here before going into the case study any questions so far Let's see something in the chat. MF used for model building. Uh, what does MF mean? In matrix factorization, perhaps. Um, I, I guess what you mean here is uh, using matrix factorization 
for uh, as a feature or do you want to use matrix calculation during the model itself like in your model itself maybe uh, he meant for building the model yeah or so uh, if, if if that's the case uh, i think that the key trouble there is inference um, in in my in my experience i've seen matrix factorization fit mostly with uh, offline inference there is fewer cases where i've seen matrix factorization used for online worlds uh, because it tends to mutate less uh, but again that's that's my take on it i'm pretty sure that there may be some folks that want to use matrix factorization in online solving as well but again as long as that fit that model paradigm fits the solution it's the right one it the ml ops is kind of model agnostic you can bring your own model its question is how to serve those out to production so with that i'll do a brief case study um for folks that are looking at this this is the architecture for feast based on what i have described in the space of feature store uh first question is uh what does feast not have i like take a moment to just look at this uh like diagram it i'm i'm hoping based on this most of the components seem recognizable so what does feast not provide So, I, uh, so, so I can take a stab here. If you notice here, the creation part uh, very obviously lives outside of the Feast ecosystem. What Feast centralizes on is providing you a single central API for maintaining, defining, and serving your features. So, if you see here, there's a central component here called the feature repo, which is Feast's declarative way of letting you define your feature ecosystem. It, it could be my feature is this particular feature. It is keyed on these entities this is how you look them up this is where they are stored this is how to produce them all of that stuff will live inside that repo and that is all the information feast needs based on that the sdk lets you actually materialize these features and by materializing what it means is it knows where they live in the offline world it takes it waits for those features to be ready it puts them in the online world based on your definition space it provides you a serving layer that reads from this online store uh use uses that this information to know how to serve this back to your models in production as well as to your models in training and that's the feast sdk so it provides you provides you the apis to read read your features it's it calls it get historical features and get online features but that's pretty much like the simple simplest form of its form of its api but you as the end user as the end data scientist don't need to know what's the best practice to connect to a data warehouse bring the data back in spark how can i put that into a data frame how do i join these into my existing frame and how can i enrich my training set or how can i enrich my learning set right all of those problems are taken away from your plate all you really need to do is define a name for your feature and a couple of other metadata pieces and the sdk does that as for you but you as a data scientist are responsible for putting them in the store in the first place it doesn't create those features for you it lets you create them but once created it takes care of the rest So this is one example of a feature store that skips the generation parts but specializes on a lot on the offline online storage. Right, uh, going on, uh, I'll move faster through the rest of the agenda just to leave room for a lot of questions at the end. But let's let's try to now think about this. So we've looked a lot at how I can serve my model, but we never really address the question of what goes in there. Like how do I actually build my model? it's it's not enough to just serve it right i need to be able to build a good model and consistently do it uh, for my ecosystem when you put on the ml ops hat there's a few questions to ask or think about when you think about model training first is what are we modeling we first need to be able to assemble our training data and th this is a broad space it takes a lot of time for data scientists to assemble the right data this is a data engineering problem while it's easy to model something it's equally difficult to build the right data once we do that then we kind of go to the framework choice 
I now need to pick the right framework that models my problem at hand, right? Like matrix factorization, as someone has mentioned, is one, but there is, you know, deep learning models, there's transfer learning, there's a, like embedding similarity, uh, two tower models. There's a lot of different ways to do recommendations. So how do I pick the right model? The, the next part is to think about scale. How much are we modeling? And believe it or not, this, has, this is actually a really important question. What works for a few million data points in training does not scale for hundred million or a billion data points. You actually need to start thinking about how to scale model training at that point. Once you do that, you know, you need to start thinking about tuning your models. Model frameworks are few. There's only a few paradigms you can choose, but there's a lot of knobs to turn. In deep learnings, you can just play around with as many things as you want, really. So how do we choose the right hyperparameters? I mean, and lastly, I finished producing a model. How do I actually connect it to my production ecosystem, right? Like, I need to manage my models. I built a model, but who's going to put it in these, these model pods? Who's responsible for put plugging it into online inference or offline inference based on how I choose my system? So with these questions, MLOps isn't really about finding the answers to these questions. I'm sure any data scientist, given the right tools, can find the answer themselves. The problem space that we operate in is making this repeatable, reproducible, and really easy to choose. Like, as a data scientist, the, the MLOps engineer is going to try and make your life as simple as possible so that you can focus on the modeling problem and give get these answers for free. So, uh, going into each one of these questions in a bit more detail. Sorry, by the way, any questions on these questions? Any things to ask about these considerations? I think the, the, these questions motivate uh, more interactions between data scientists and MLOps engineers. Uh, and I, I would love to know your thoughts on that at some point in the lecture as well. And, uh, you know, how that, how you've seen that materialize or if, you know, over communication, you know, exchange of information, how does that, is it easy? Is it, uh, you know, maybe in a well-knit team it happens, but if there's yep. like separate teams, you know, uh, then the communication gaps, but th th you can address that at an appropriate time. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I'll table that one for the end. I think that's a really interesting one. Uh, I'll save that for the last. Um, yeah, so let's let's dive into each one of these five pieces in a little more detail. Um, assembling data is sounds very simple. Like it's just putting things together. I join, I write a SQL, it just works. Uh, but it's a little more nuanced than that. Like you you kind of start to start thinking about how you'll store your data. Embeddings, sparse arrays need a bit of different handling. Numerical features, categorical variables are a bit easier. How do I connect these two in storage and compute? Tensors, higher dimensionals, computer vision based recommendations, uh, add multiple exponentials in your running time complexity. So can I handle these better? Can my system now evolve to understand that better? Um, and so there's three solutions that we focus on to, uh, to make this problem easier. First is the compute engine needs to address the problem that the data scientists are solving better. CV problems need a better compute framework or a different one as compared to simple numericals. Uh, we need to start thinking about storage formats. Different data needs different storage. Parquet works really well for native formats, but RDBMS or uh, uh, relational databases work better for indexed data. So like I want to join data more, Perhaps a NoSQL SQL database is going to do better than Parquet formats. Depending on the choice you make, storage formats plus com compute frameworks play really well with each other. And that brings to the third part, which is abstract APIs. If possible, we want to make the choice of storage format and compute frameworks easy for the data scientists. How should I store my data or what format should it go in isn't a question you want to particularly be answering. So can I put these behind a black box library? Can I make this easy? That kind of goes into addressing the assembling data problem. Uh, and there's a lot of work that's gone into this. If folks are curious, take a look at Petastorm. Uber built an entire storage format just to make a particular space of problems, which is high dimensional tensors easier, right? So many things have gone into different optimizations for your problem space. The next part is choosing a framework. Production ML doesn't really focus on, you know, tweaking, like, tweaking the accuracy precision to the maximum. It's about what's, it's finding a model that is good enough. And I want to pick that first and go from there. Like it's, a, it's an incremental search. How do we build a model that gives me my current business gains? You know, I want to increase click-through rate, so on and so forth, 
with the least cost with our current latency budget at our scale make that repeatable so on like that's the problem space you're operating in in terms of choosing a framework so based on that what more what model architecture should you pick if you are working on linear data you will still do really well if you build a deep neural network but that's not the right answer you want to pick some some kind of uh, gbtts right some gradient boosted decision tree is going to make your life a lot more simple in terms of predicting on a linear data as compared to deep neural networks however the reverse is true gbtts won't solve um, a non linear problem if that if that's what you're looking for as business case so choosing the right framework is really important and helping a designer to pick that is also an important problem to solve framework choices that you make should align with your inference framework first and this is a very counterintuitive way of thinking but a model that does well offline isn't going to help you if you can't serve it efficiently in production if you pick a really complex dnn that um is really high accuracy but it takes 500 milliseconds to serve and what your latency budget is 100 milliseconds you are not going to do well with that model in production so understanding your framework choice will matter depending on your inference budgets inference workflows and so on but lastly always listen to your data scientists you need to find like i think i'm kind of giving away a part of kartik's answer here but you can you cannot make a framework choice for the data scientists you need to work with them and give them some opinions on where the inference the framework will not keep up with their models and that's the give and take relationship you need to build with your community uh now for the fun part how do i scale model training this two kinds of bottlenecks that you typically run into if you are doing model training at scale the first set of problems you'll face is my model takes too long to run or i have too much data and i cannot use it the first one believe it or not there are production models that can take more than 24 hours to train and still fail there are production data sets that need 1 billion data points and can scale only to 100 million right these are the common problems you'll face and how do you solve those you need data parallel training you need to be able to run more sets in chunks of data and that's what data parallel training goes into you have the one model you take in a chunk of data train some epochs move on to the next and so on and so forth and these are well solved problems it's not like we are not reinventing the wheel here data parallel training exists in most popular frameworks but it is really difficult to use if you don't have the right infrastructure for it you need to have a set of cluster management tools you need to have a, uh, a runner that given a data parallel run can actually execute it that's where ml ops comes in a second bottleneck that is more rare is model size if your model is too large to host on a single node and trust me there can be models that go into hundreds of gigabytes and more depending on how many embeddings they train what kind of embeddings they want to store and so on and so forth that's a rarer bottleneck and you actually now need to explore model parallel training and again this exists frameworks can do this pytorch tensorflow all of these big companies have built tooling that let you train big models but you need infrastructure that can do it if your infrastructure can't keep up any any framework is not going to work you're going to be stuck with one node and not know what to do next um so you need to solve this problem uh this one's an easy one you want to tune your models hyperparameter tuning is a very explored space and many companies have focused on trying to provide hyperparameter tuning as a service uh and what this really does is it gives you a library interface simple black box tuning which says i want to do bayesian optimization i want to do neural architecture search and that will just let you tune your model for free lastly model management you do everything you got your model trained hooray i ha i have an output but that's just half the problem these models need to be searchable retrievable reproducible i keep training new models i need to have a place where they are stored i need to know which models i trained recently how they were trained and be able to put those for serving so this blanket solution space is called a model repository umbrella solution again has many connotations but largely these allow your models to have api backed storage and retrieval so something is going to be able to know where your model is pull it out for you give it to you or store it for you and put it in, put it in a safe location replicated all of the stuff it needs to have index metadata i need to know which hyperparameters i was tuned on can i change those like if i put this model in production do i know what went into it which training script which data set all of that stuff index metadata is required to keep track of that 
And then lastly, you need some form of auditability. If some model is in production, you need to be able to trace it back. You need to be able to trace back who built it, why they built that model, what data set went into it. Is that person still at the company, right? Like so many times you are left with models that somebody put into production and that person is not at the company. And now you no longer know how that model was built and you want to change it, but you can't because you have to rebuild it. So starting from scratch is a big problem. You want your models to be auditable. So a lot of things to think about. How do we go forward to design a model training infrastructure? Now, unlike our previous sections, I, I'll be less prescriptive here because model training infrastructure is less homogenous. There is very different, many, many different ways to do this. But broadly, if you have a feature store, we discussed an offline feature store for training. If you have a good warehouse, an easy paradigm to think about, and again, it's not the only one, is data scientists brings their own data. You, you, you figure out how to give us your training data. You bring your own models. You bring us a training script. You, you tell us how you want to train your models and you push those into a training service. And a training service is responsible for giving you distributed training, tunable, para, like tunable models, all of those for free. Maybe they'll give you a bit of an API you need to follow. They'll, they'll give you a few bounds that your training script should follow these, these constraints, but bring us your model, bring us your training script. We'll do the rest for you and put it in the model repository. This is the most common architecture for most training ecosystems. Scales really well, very easy to adapt to, um, and work really well in production. Taking a closer look at these, again, we go back to containerized runtimes. You need to be prescriptive of what your model training architecture looks like, what are what paradigms you can operate in, and those need to be reproducible in your training service. Secondly, you need a training service that actually can distribute your workloads, distribute your training, and tune it for you and produce the final outputs you care about. That's the contract the service has with the data scientist, give me a model. And thirdly, you need a model repository that is metadata rich, available, can store your models as objects. Optionally, you can put these together in a single combined wrapper, which is the library interface that combines feature store APIs, data APIs, model framework wrappers, put those all in a neat bow, so that you can call you know, sklearn.fit, sklearn.transform, all of that becomes really easy to do. One form of a wrapper, it's really um, optional. You could do this yourself, it just makes life easier, but not really a make or break deal. Going back to the secret sauce, uh, you can, like plumbing is important, but here we go into ML engineering. This part is the closest to, like, to ML that you get within MLOps. You need to care about the runtimes that need to be compatible with what data scientists want. You need containers that are compatible with how data scientists can train. You need a notebook interface. You need a bunch of developer tools, how to debug models, a bunch of things go into this ecosystem. You need to have a repository that can represent their data correctly and finally push those out into your ecosystem in the production, which we have discussed so far, feature store plus uh, serving. Last slide before I take a pause, for questions, in production, again, we ask the questions, how do we measure our training training infrastructure performance? Um, firstly is developer velocity. How quickly can a data scientist take their idea into an executing running training flow? Really important benchmark, feedback driven, that's where quality goes. Can I do this quickly? Second piece is experiment velocity. If I know an idea and I built my training scripts, how quickly does it run? Right, that goes into the efficiency of your distributed training ecosystem, your distributed tuning ecosystem. Both of those decide how quickly they can build their experiments. These need to be flexible. You can't actually say, I will do PyTorch only or TensorFlow only. You may have data scientists that want to build different kinds of recommendation systems. You need to be flexible enough to be, adapt to, uh, to be able to adapt to those problems. And then lastly, your training service needs to be reliable and scalable. If my run failed, I need to know why it failed. If my run succeeded, I need to have a log. My model binary needs to be consistently in the repository. That plumbing needs to be complete. So it's not like, you know what, I'll accept low user reliability constraints here. No, the system needs to be accountable. And a data scientist needs to know a feedback loop about when the model is ready, where is it, so on and so forth. In the wild, lots of buy solutions. One of the richest buy space of all of the MLOps spaces, that's cube for ply plug, cube flow pipelines, there's ML flow, SageMaker has a rich training ecosystem. Raytrain is the next big thing that's prior, you know, prioritizing how you train your models. Spark has its own ML library that focuses on bringing data and training a model, putting it into your production ecosystem. 
but many companies still choose to build their own training ecosystems simply because the training ecosystem is the has the highest burden of flexibility because production ecosystems the infrastructure are set in stone you do you build your infrastructures first because that's the product and then you decide how models can go in there and so you want your training ecosystem to adapt to your serving framework and not vice versa the serving framework cannot be built on based on how your training ecosystem works so that's the catch which is why build solutions are still strong because you adapt to how your production ecosystem goes for i'll take a quick pause i'm running close to the end of time and so i'll have to breeze through my last section but any questions so far i i will take 3 minutes before and not take more of your time to quickly go through the last part which is iteration this is an important question to answer right i built a great model in production why am i building a new one why do i care about continuously building newer models a few reasons for this first is business goals change like what was click through rate today could be something else tomorrow you could be targeting conversions instead uh, or engagement instead right your your product goals can evolve or newer business problems can come into emergence so relevance is important so you need to keep building towards that but other things that are model specific is your models could stop performing start performing poorly you could actually see a performance regression you could have great click through rates yesterday but today suddenly your models are no longer doing that why um you could also have drift in your data right your your, your user patterns could change uh what was like it could you like, like you could have seasonality right what was good in august in winter could be irrelevant in summer right so you could have data drift and you your models may not capture that so you need to evolve your models to capture that instead and lastly there could be features ideas you could not explore before because they weren't easy to do either because your company didn't have the infrastructure to do it or because you didn't have the bandwidth to do it right so now can i step back and explore those new ideas and push the limits of my models few reasons why you could iterate and build new models um easy enough to do it and lastly like incrementality is always great right if you could take one year to build a model great but that that's one year lost by a company instead build a model in a month push it to production get some gains and iterate on it right easy easy enough reason to iterate on your models over time rather than silo them and take a long time to build one uh so the few the one thing that you kind of automate in ml ops is the performance segment of it business goals i can't change right business goals is not an ml ops problem similarly uh you know new ideas new frameworks again a data scientist problem if if it's possible go forth and do it but how can i improve the measurement of model performance and what do i need to do it three things are required first is you need to log your inferences online or offline service doesn't really matter when it hits production you need a log for what was shown to the user because that is what inference was served and once you do that the second piece you need is to log your actuals like how am i actually measuring my labels uh did i convert on certain set of users did i not convert on certain set of users or were my recommendations even relevant kind of goes into what your actuals are and you need to log those by your inferences and then lastly you need a performance metric that ties these two together depending on your problem you need a measure of success one really good example of why this is important is conversions are a low positive sample rate you could serve 10 recommendations only one of them is going to trigger a conversion doesn't necessarily mean the other nine were bad you just need to like rank your positive higher but you can't actually train the rank the less rest as negatives so you need a performance metric that balances that skew because a natural skew you need to balance for the performance metric a general entropy metric isn't going to work right so those three pieces are important you need to be able to let your data scientists define these three systems for their problem and then based on that you can kind of detect regressions and drifts through threshold based monitoring outlier detection and anomaly detection three ways to do this and not holistic but three good ways where you can actually now start trying to measure how your model performance is degrading you could be triggering some thresholds or you could have some outliers that are really bad um or you could have an anomaly detection framework which addresses a change in your drift uh, like data or prediction patterns uh i'll skip this one but effectively there's few good techniques to experiment with your models you could ab test you could shadow test you could continuously deploy new models
but don't put your models in production before you know how to have some measurement of how they're going to perform and experimentation techniques go to do that if you trained a new version of your model how do i measure if this does better than the one i have in production already or not and these techniques try to address some of those if i could leave you with one closing thought it's it's that production ml operates like a flywheel ml ops focuses on making that wheel as smooth and fast as possible but it really is about keeping the wheel moving you want you go through different changes you go from development to training to continuous training you put your model in production you collect some observations on how that model is doing and you go back to the drawing board ml ops focuses on making this quick you each part can be automated can be made faster for the data scientist you could do this without ml ops of course you could it's about how quick each of these steps can be made if you have those in place who there's a lot um i hope that helps but i you know i can stick around for a little while longer for questions but thank you so much this was um really an enjoyable session yeah thank you so much kunal this was a really enlightening session uh for all of us and uh, you know a lot of great questions from everyone and a lot of insights and understanding um and uh, yeah we can continue to hang around um and you know if people have questions and discussions to ask uh, as as long as uh, kunal is comfortable and then we we can close <laughs> but i mean if you have to leave at this point you can uh, the lecture is officially done uh, but we'll hang around for some discussions thanks um, <laughs> no i can say let's stick around for like five minutes more just in case this question i couldn't get to but yeah thank you so much for uh, having me yeah um so so kunal just as a practical question uh, and i'll let others ask questions as well uh, feel free to if you haven't asked a question yet uh, is let's take a practical example so let's say we want to do hashtag recommendation for images uh, because you can search by hashtag and it's useful to drag and it's it's a very hot area i mean you can also do hashtag recommendation for videos uh, with a lot of videos coming out in the market so uh, then now i have the cnn model plus uh, extra things going on for hashtag as well and so i have like this 15 layer model and i want to do online serving so uh, how would we think about ml ops in this situation and what trade offs would we want to make if you can just uh, walk through that great question um so first let's start with the idea that you know you need the 15 layers and you do as a data scientist are adamant like i i need my 15 layers and these are really important for my inference my model is going to uh, really like really suffer without it it's doable right like you could have those 15 layers what you really need is beefier machines and most likely an easy way to do this is if you are missing the sls put gpu inference behind it right like you can actually iterate on the hardware and solve like uh, the power of your stack just to fit the exact use case again so what i'm doing here is allowing you to run the model as you built it by putting on more costs and solving it that way and again this is a choice that ml ops tends to make many a times when data scientists can't figure out a better way to build a model because ml ops cannot build the model for you right so we have let's assume for now that i have no understanding of what the model is supposed to do as compared to what you do right so we will we'll defer to that part and we'll ask the right questions we'll say like oh if this is fine do it but then we kind of go to one step lower which is like you know what does your model need 15 layers and if it does can we pull out some of the like the like what we discussed some of the pieces to it as offline features i i have more computational power offline maybe i can do some things that are not request specific and put those offline one way folks do that today is you actually build entire features on top of lstm embeddings or other kind of embeddings that run offline on a daily cadence that convert let's say images into embeddings right so let's say i want to serve hashtag recommendations i could have a daily job or maybe an hourly job that indexes all the new images that i have and puts those embeddings into a feature store for me right now really my problem reduces to the nearest neighbor problem i need to find the nearest embeddings to my hashtag so now i don't really need to retrain new hashtag embeddings or image embeddings both exist offline my online problem reduces to finding nearest neighbor online embeddings and that way i can convert your models into offline models and put the online part just as the serving layer that does the search across the embeddings so that's some spaces that we kind of iterate with our data scientists on and that is also some ways to leverage uh the right questions and a different part of the stack 
to solve the same problem. So a lot of creativity that goes into <laughs> uh, this, this specifically these kind of issues, the, the design, because uh, you may have to change the architecture itself to accommodate MLOps in some cases. Correct. Uh, yeah, but more than creativity, it's also like the creativity still falls on the data scientist. Our role is to have the solutions in place such that they can explore more than one ways to build their models or build their product use case. So the creativity is still something that we throw back to the data scientists. Uh, but mm -hmm. we maybe help them explore that creativity faster. I think Ishan has a question. Um, yeah, Kunal, I just had a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, I, I had a question regarding optimization of our system. So when we are talking about different kind of testing phases, we also look at some kind of statistical approaches. So let's uh, say that we are looking at a system where we utilize multi-arm bandits and uh, uh -huh. So where does this kind of uh, uh, technique uh, help us? Like, and when do we think that uh, this would be useful in our system? So, uh, and, uh, you know, discarding all kind of traditional um, things and uh, implementing this kind of uh, approach would give us better results. So when, when does it come into play? Does it apply on to the application layer or somewhere else into our model? Good question. Uh, really good question, actually. So. A lot of what I covered today actually isn't the right fit for online learning. So multi amp bandits and some form of um, reinforcement learning techniques kind of fall into the domain of reacting better based on feedback loops right away. So there isn't a feedback loop that you see in this system, right? Like it's kind of relying on the fact that you have a pre-trained model that had good labels and then use that in as part of our serving. So you would need a more specialized system that focuses on multi arm bandits. And again, it's some flavor of what you have in production. Like you could still have a service that knows what it needs to do. But the service is no longer just like, oh, I am hosting a fixed model. Let's train on that model and throw it out. You kind of need more inputs that come into the system. And you need to respond to that and adapt your existing model and then see what you need to respond with. So a different training paradigm and a different serving paradigm. That's kind of like the best answer I have for the moment. But yeah, it definitely did not cover that in these slides. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you so much for your answer. Anyone I, else? Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, this was so insightful, Kunal. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be putting this up on YouTube for uh, you know people to look over again and also people who haven't seen it before. And there's a lot of interest, um, I think. Uh, and also curiously, even though we said MLOps for recommended systems, a lot of the uh, solutions and uh, breakdowns and trade-offs that you shared apply to any kind of a setup, right? You can do multi-class classification for something and that's not recommended systems and um, even anomaly detection or anything that so unsupervised even unsupervised learning architectures and uh, a lot of these trade-offs apply in those scenarios as well. Uh, so that's- They do, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think recommended systems can use some specialization to make things even faster if you are specializing on those, but really most MLOps problems are broadly relevant to many uh, ML uh, questions. A reinforcer in reinforcement learning or multi amp band aside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I, I hope multi arm bandits is catching up at uh, companies because uh, A-B testing has been around for quite some time, but you know, but then uh, yeah, you can get bigger gains in some places with multi arm yep. bandits. It's it's depends on the MLOps it's available at that place. <laughs> Absolutely. It is. Doing it. Right. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, and yeah, uh, have a good day.